Good evening. Would you please stand and join together in the Pledge of Allegiance? And after the Pledge of Allegiance, we will be singing God Bless America, and the lyrics are on the back of your program. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. I'd like to thank our two accompanists tonight, the, the first being David Getz and then his father, uh, Mark Getz. So uh, the Getz family is well represented tonight. The community of Morton is honored to be hosting this special event tonight. This is the evening of personal reflections of Congressman Ray LaHood and former Congressman Bob Michael. As Mayor Morton, please allow me to welcome you, Ray, and also you, Bob, and all of you for being here tonight for this very special event. We gathered tonight, or we gathered eight years ago in this, in this facility for its dedication. This is a beautiful facility. And not since then have we had such a prestigious occasion as this. As I recall, Ray, I think you gave the keynote spe uh, speech at that occasion. Four other men are here tonight who previously worked on the developing the Bertha Frank Center. These men are Wayne Baum, Bill Morton, Bill Schmidtgall, and Jim Yorty, each are friends of both Ray's and Bob's. These four men believe that tonight will be a lifelong historical experience for all of you and all of us. They appreciate your very strong support for our honored guests. I think we need to show our appreciation of these four men for what they've done for us tonight. In case you didn't know, that wasn't on the script I was given. <laughs> I'll pay for that later, no doubt. Now to begin our inspirational evening, we have four young men whose families have been uh, members of this community for generations. They'll be singing our invocation tonight. Please welcome Trace Davis, Dan Getz, Cole Nicholson, and Caleb Fletter. Seven loaves of bread, there's a man in here who makes demons flee, who makes cripples walk, and has chosen even me, for he lives in my heart, and I have no fear, I'm a better man, cause there's a man in here, there's a man in here that I'm looking for, cried the man who could find no room at the door, so they lowered him down on a stretcher bed. Jesus looked 
so man in here the disciples cried when the ship was tossed from side to side so they woke him up as the waves blew high and said don't you care that we're about to die he said peace be still when the wind had laid he said where is your faith why were you so afraid when they saw that the sea Sight to the blind, and he gives back life to the ones that are dead, and he fed four thousand with seven loaves of bread. There's a man in here who makes demons flee, who makes cripples walk, and has chosen even me, for he lives in my heart, and I have no fear. I'm a better man, cause there's a man in here. I'm a better man, cause there's a man. Thank you for that excellent invocation, guys. That was wonderful. Our evening of personal reflection will be guided tonight by Frank Mackman, who is sitting with Ray and Bob up here on the stage. Frank is a historian and serves as director of the Dirksen Congressional Center. He's had many years of experience in political science as a professor in, at, at the university level. And he has also been the past director of the Harold, or I'm sorry, Gerald F. Ford Library and Museum in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Please join me in welcoming Frank Mackman. I have Bob's rich baritone on one song, and these gentlemen and their beautiful singing voices, I have a tough act to follow. Welcome. It's a personal and professional pleasure for me to join Ray and Bob on the stage to talk about their combined 50 years of experience in Washington, D.C., representing this community and representing the nation. As Norm mentioned, I'm an historian. Historians are supposed to be objective, but I'm making no claim to objectivity this evening. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are just terrific. And I believe and agree with Everett Dirksen that individuals make a difference. And I want to read something to you. Um, this is Everett Dirksen responding to a question about the nation's future during a particularly bleak time. And he responded to the question with these words. We must go back not to aggregations of men, not to empires and nations, not to coalitions and unions, not to compacts and treaties, not to agreements and covenants, but to man, individual man, and the potential power in his soul, in his heart, and in the engine of his mind. It is therefore man and man alone who can give us hope and dissolve the fears and vexations of this age. And we have with us this evening two gentlemen who in their beliefs and actions over five decades fulfilled Everett Dirksen's aspiration for humankind. Here's how I propose we proceed this evening. Ray asked me to provide a little bit of context by talking about the 18th Congressional District, which I'm happy to do in a few minutes. The conversation will then move into biography. What influenced these gentlemen in their formative years here in central Illinois? What and who inspired them to public service? How were they introduced into Washington? What were their impressions? Next, they will share their experience serving 10 presidents, and actually 11 if you count Harry Truman, who was president when Bob first arrived in Washington, D.C., as aide to then Congressman Harold Veldy. I think it will be fascinating to learn how Ray and Bob size up these historic figures. What were they like if you were in, alone in a room with them? 
What qualities of leadership or political skill or human understanding did they exhibit? How should we think of them in hindsight? I imagine, too, that during the course of our conversation, we'll talk about events all of us remember, whether it's September 11th, the Nixon resignation, the assassination of John Kennedy. I imagine we'll touch on those kinds of events, too. This really isn't a conversation about politics or legislation or how a bill becomes law. This is really a conversation of personal reflections. So let me begin with the 18th Congressional District that Ray and Bob have represented since 1957. After admission to the Union, Illinois had but a single representative in the United States House, a gentleman by the name of John McLean, a lawyer from Shawneetown, who took his seat as representative at large on December 4, 1818. So you could say that the first person to occupy the chair these gentlemen have held was Mr. McLean. Now, I'm not going to read through all the 19th century representatives of, of this area. The real legacy that we're dealing with begins with Abraham Lincoln, who, as a member of the Whig Party, represented central Illinois in what was then the 7th Congressional District. He served only one term in the House, March 1847 to 1849, he retired from politics for a time at that point, then twice, unsuccessfully, sought the United States Senate seat, a United States Senate seat from this state. But he went on to bigger things. Says something about the value of persistence. Since 1900, eight men have represented what is now the 18th Congressional District. They are, in order of service, Joseph V. Graff, Claudius U. Stone, Clifford Ireland, William E. Hall, Everett M. Dirksen, Harold Veldy, Bob Michael, and Ray LaHood. All were Republicans save Stone, who served from 1911 to 1917 and later became editor and publisher of the Peoria Star. Five of the eight hailed from Peoria County, the others from Tazewell County. Five of the eight held law degrees. And five, not the same five, were military veterans. There are, as you probably know, 435 congressional districts in the United States at this time. That a single district produces the likes of Abraham Lincoln, Everett Dirksen, Bob Michael, and Ray LaHood is pretty remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. Both gentlemen are products of central Illinois, so I'm going to turn to the biographical portion of the presentation. Now, Bob was born in 1923 and Ray in 1945, so Bob has, shall we say, a little bit longer timeline uh, than Ray. But Bob, I'm curious, what were the lessons of your upbringing that helped you succeed in politics? Well, I guess the determination of what's right and what's wrong. Um, I think that was a guiding... Uh, in my uh, uh, early uh, years, in, uh, my, I came from parents uh, of a very conservative persuasion. Um, I, uh, we, my dad used to uh, have uh, the kids to read the scripture after the evening dinner meal. Uh, I never heard my mother or my father use one harsh word. Darn would, <laughs> would, would rankle my father. And uh, it was under that, in that kind of conservative background, they're very religious and, uh, uh, people and uh, felt strongly about, it, about their beliefs. And uh, of course, uh, we were obliged to go to church, go to Sunday school and uh, read the good, good, good book. And uh, uh, that sure certainly didn't do me any harm. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's the kind of environment in which I was really brought up. As a matter of fact, of course, the, the other thing was to, the ethic of work. My father lived to work. I must say, Ray and I were up in Peoria Heights last night. And we were next to that uh, grade school up there. I think it was Peoria Heights Grade School. And I told him of the incident when I was pitching for White Grade School. And I was a good softball pitcher in those days. And we were winning more games than we were losing. And lo and behold, in this very critical game, 
about halfway through, my father comes by with a Model A Ford and pulls me out of the game to go work in the garden. Uh-huh. And, the, and the principal of the school, uh, you know, who was head of our coach, just couldn't understand why this would happen. But my father was a French immigrant. He, was, uh, he came here to work and to make the best of things. And, uh, you know, uh, and I was supposed to work in the garden, uh, work before pleasure. And uh, as a matter of fact, what I, I, instead of having one paper out, I had three, two in the morning and one in the evening. I worked in a tailor shop. I worked in a grocery store peeling lettuce and, and all the kind of things you do there. I worked in a tailor shop, enjoyed that very much, <laughs> helped me later on. Um, so it was uh, one of, uh, oh, and back in those days, I think I was mowing the neighbor's grass for 35 cents a yard. Those were depression days. That's the other key thing was I was a depression child. And I can remember several of my uncles uh, hopping uh, freight cars back to the east to try and find job. And it was Jarvis Chevrolet, I think, in Peoria. And uh, they were good mechanics and one thing or another. And when they'd come home on Friday night and the meager check they had for piecework, I was getting more from my three paper routes than my uncles were getting in piecework working at Jarvis. I tell you when, and then when mother was a great homemaker and she could make the most of what, what there was available. And if we had oxtail soup, you know, the first night you, uh, you, uh, you just ate the soup and the oxtail was left over for the next night to make some kind of hash or something. But I say that because that was the kind of environment in which I grew up and a penny saved, a penny earned, and you, you really had to work hard to, to, to get anything, you know. So um, uh, that's my, <laughs> the kind of rearing I had as a child. And as I said, when I look back on it, sure so it didn't, didn't do me any harm. No. Now, Ray, you come after World War II, so you have different influences from Central Illinois. Could you describe how, what you took away from your upbringing in this area? Well, I grew up in the, on the East Bluff of Peoria, and it was a, that was a community unto its own. We had our own drugstore. We had our own doctor. Uh, St. Francis Hospital was kind of like our own personal hospital. I went to St. Bernard's grade school. I went to, I served mass probably two or three days a week. The influence of the priests and the, and the sisters and the teachers that I had, uh, obviously my parents had a great deal of influence, but my father worked uh, 12, 15 hours a day. He was in the restaurant and business and um, he worked hard day and night. And, uh, you know, obviously the one thing that he, said there I have two brothers and one thing that he said obviously is you got to have a good education mm -hmm. but not dissimilar to Bob's upbringing hard work and uh, just uh, a good education but the East Bluff neighborhood was a community unto itself in Peoria and uh, I've told people in the medical profession about the great relationship we had with our doctor with our pharmacists, with Haddad's grocery store, with Shaheen's hardware store. And for those of you who know about these Bluff, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, sadly, both of my schools are closed. St. Bernard's closed a year ago with 75 students. It had 400 students when I was a student there, all, all nuns teaching us. We had three priests in our parish at the time. And now Spalding High School, of course, has been combined with uh, Bergen and is now Notre Dame High School. So. The East Bluff was a great, great place to grow up. And when people say, you know, who had the most influence? Obviously my parents, but the teachers I had. That's the reason I became a teacher, mm -hmm. because of the influence of the teachers that I had in grade school and high school. What, so where did you acquire your interest in politics? Was it while you were teaching? Did you exactly. Prepare? When I was growing up in Peoria, I never knew the name of one politician. I could not tell you who a city councilman was. We never talked about politics in our house. I don't know if my parents knew who the politicians were, but I certainly didn't. And it's just, it was not a part of, uh, of our upbringing. It just simply was not. And when I started teaching and started teaching students about the Constitution, ab about how government worked, I taught civics. I taught at St. Joseph's School in Pekin for two years. I taught at 
Holy Family School for two years in Peoria, and then I taught at Oak Grove in the limestone area for two years. That's what sparked my interest in politics. That's when I ran for uh, precinct committeeman, uh, and uh, that's when I really, uh, that's what sparked my interest. Uh, and I left teaching because Kathy is here tonight, and I know some of you had a chance. She said, we're not going to make any money in education. You've got to get out of teaching. <laughs> That's the truth, too, I'm telling you. And she said, you've got to find something else. And she's, so that's when I went to work in government. I worked for a good friend of Bob's, Tom Railsback, for five and a half years, who was a congressman. And then I had the great privilege of working for Bob for 12 years. So, Well, Bob... What did your parents think when you told them you were going to Washington, D.C. in 1949? How did they react to that? Well, it wasn't exactly that I was going to Washington, but that I was going down to an interview with oh. Judge Veldy, who is the circuit judge, uh, at the request of the president of Bradley University that day. Before I uh, um, was ready to graduate, he called me in and said, Bob, what are you going to do after graduation? I said, well, I don't really know for sure. I've taken all the insurance courses. I'd like to, a number of my friends were in the insurance business, and, and uh, it's looking after people's uh, security. That interested me. And uh, uh, he said, well, I, I tell you, I've been observing you on campus, and, uh, and I, I got involved in politics in, uh, in uh, college, uh, managing this one or that one's campaign or participate, or even leading the Star Spangled Banner at their rallies, you know, they needed a <laughs> singer to do things like that, or God Bless America, like the young boys were doing for us here this evening. And, um, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I told uh, President Owen at the time, I said, well, I haven't taken political science, I haven't taken uh, uh, journalism, uh, mine was economics and business administration. He says, you go have the interview. Uh, he needs a man Friday. And I think, from as I've observed you on, on, on campus, uh, you'd be well suited for that. It was by, so you talk about a quirk of fate. You know, I didn't have any pre-designs on that at all. It was just, and that's when I'm telling high school and college kids sometimes when opportunity knocks, you never know for sure. But if there is an opportunity, boy, you better seize it, mm -hmm. you know, before it's too late. Well, lo and behold, I came down here to rode the bus down to Pekin, had an interview with Judge Velde, and uh, his secretary was taken down on uh, an exchange, as she did as a court reporter, you know. And uh, before, the inter before I left for home, he was much as telling me that, you know, if I wanted to work in politics, uh, he was willing to take me on to work in the campaign. Now he says, of course in politics you can't make very much money. And, um, <laughs> and uh, that was at that time, maybe. But, and then, and, and then uh, the reason being, my college cra uh, class at Bradley, I think in 1948, oh, I suspect average uh, uh, graduate.